Hello, 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 and welcome to uh, another Aconite in conversation with. This is our first one in a little while. We've uh, uh, been a bit slack on them. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, but we are back uh, and we are here talking to Jane Killick today about In the Shadow of Demos, which is our first terraforming Mars uh, novel. Very excited. Um, it got a lot of uh, questions and queries uh, over UK Games Expo weekend. Lots and lots of excitement from fans uh, to see a novel in the Terraforming Mars world. So welcome, Jane. Welcome. Good morning. It's morning in the UK. I hope <laughs> if any Americans wanted to join us, I'm sorry if you're asleep. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. It'll be fine. This will be on video on demand afterwards as well so i'll make sure that people are know where they can watch it um, excellent it's, it's very early <laughs> no it's not that very early i've been working for two hours but i still feel like it's very early um yes so this is uh yeah this is our, our first stream in a little while um jane you are new to our streams um, yeah yes. never done it before never done facebook live before never done never done it before <laughs> it's 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 good fun. It's nice. I like Facebook Live. It's less stressful than like we started on Twitch and uh, that was very stressful. Uh, but Facebook Live is is pretty chill and you can good do like ad hoc interviews, which are nice. So tell us a little bit about yourself because you're new and yeah, because people may not know who you are, and what you do. No. So um, I started writing about science fiction things, TV and everything for magazines way back in the 90s and then I did a few books about that um, and then I decided to concentrate on my fiction so then I did a few fiction books and in the meantime I also do radio work. I was freelancing doing both for a while and now I actually have a proper job mm -hmm. so I work for BBC local radio reading the news in the afternoon which is why I'm available in the morning and uh, I try I mix the two and sometimes it's a bit stressful trying to get it all done, but uh, yeah, and but most of the time it's fine. Yes, yes. Well, uh, tell us a little bit more about the book then, as this is like the first one. For anyone who isn't aware of the setting, the board game, and also the book itself, tell us... Uh, Okay, so the board game is obviously set on Mars. It's about terraforming Mars, which is basically uh, making... The planet, which is, uh, I think, second nearest neighbour, because I think Venus is a bit closer, um, habitable for the human race, which is kind of difficult because it's got next to no oxygen. The atmosphere is incredibly thin. The gravity is about a third of the Earth. Uh, so the game takes a lot of actions that you can do to change the planet mm. into something where humans can live and breathe almost like Earth. Oh, it's very cold as well. I didn't mention that. Very cold. Um, in the... Most temperate uh, zone, which is around the, the equator, the average temperature is minus 30 Celsius, really cold. So um, there's a lot of science behind how you can change it into uh, somewhere habitable so uh, to raise the temperature and introduce oxygen. So like on Earth, we're pumping um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in a bad way, which is warming the atmosphere. You can do that in a good way in Mars to warm the atmosphere. And there's various other things you can do. You can crash asteroids into the planet to raise the temperature of the planet. Um, you can shine mirrors down from space to redirect sunlight, uh, use mirrors to redirect sunlight onto Mars to make it warmer. So there's all these things going on. And when you play the game, you do all these things and you change the planet, you raise the temperature, you raise the oxygen. So my task was to take this scenario and put characters in it and get them to interact with what's going on on Mars and terraforming Mars, um, but also have a story of their own because terraforming Mars is going to take hundreds of years. Mm. So in one book, you're not going to have one character going through you know, hundreds of years watching the planet evolve. So I've taken a, a snapshot of time and in this particular book, it is right at the beginning where the global government on Earth has said, we're going to go for terraforming Mars in a big way. We're going to get lots of corporations involved and they're going to come in and they're going to make money by doing mining. But they're also going to create oceans and forests and so forth. And I've got two characters who are the main characters are in the midst of this, working their way through being on Mars. And the incident that kicks it all off is an asteroid crashes onto Mars. It's a planned thing. It's part of the terraforming project, but something goes wrong. It splits off and a fragment lands 
on a research station, kills the person inside. One character has to investigate what went wrong. The other character suddenly finds himself promoted to the position with the guy who died, uh, his job. He does the guy who died, his job, he does that job. But then he starts to discover more about the person who died and maybe thinking, mm, was this an accident or was it deliberate? That sounds really cool. So it's a little bit, a bit, you've got a bit of sci-fi in there with the science and stuff, but there's also a bit of like conspiracy sort of, and a bit yeah. of mystery as well, which that sounds very nice. That sounds good. Yeah, so when you play the game, you're a corporation or an organisation and you're doing all these things, but then, you know, corporations, they try and uh, yeah. get one over on each other. So there's a lot of bit of backstabbing and everything. So I wanted to kind of get that feeling into it but it's really about the the people on the ground because you know yeah. like like living here like living on earth there's all these there's governments but there's also corporations and uh, like you know, google has a lot of power and facebook has a lot of power and yeah we're kind of very small people working within that world and that's kind of reflected on mars because you know we may go out to the stars but humanity never changes no <laughs> Right, and if you're interested in the book, I'm going to put a link up now into the chat so you can find it as well. And I'm going to show off the beautiful cover that we have as well, um, which is oh, such a good cover. <laughs> and the picture there at the front wraps around onto the back as well. Um, and you also see it's our background uh, for the stream. Um, really lovely. I, I remember seeing this when it came through as like a sketch. <laughs> And it was like almost right. complete. And I was like, that's not a sketch. <laughs> Damn these artists, <laughs> their ability to sketch. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful looking book as well. Right, so on with the questions then, I think. So, um, so, um, so you tell us a little bit more about um, yourself and sort of your experience writing time fiction. I know you've worked for some big names before. Okay, so I've done a lot of tie-in books. And I've done a lot of fiction, but this is my first tie-in fiction. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, right. So um, <laughs> I did it. I know. Um, the first book I did was a book about Judge Dredd, the movie, Sylvester Stallone, way back when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and that was um, a book about the making of. Um, I was supposed to be like a researcher on that book. And then suddenly I ended up writing the whole thing with two weeks notice. It was crazy. Oh and, and then uh, and then I did some books about Babylon 5, the TV show. That's a behind the scenes. How did they make it? What did the actors think of it? Went to America, interviewed all the people. Um, and then I've also done a, a book about Red Dwarf because I used to write for Red Dwarf magazine. So I had loads and loads of interview material. I uh, went on the set of that and... So those are all the tie-in books. And then I realized that basically I wasn't going to make a fortune writing tie-in books. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think I got a real job or something along the way. And I really wanted to write fiction. And I just, every time I sat down to write fiction, I got a tie-in job and I just had to put yeah. it all aside because they had deadlines were tight, whatever. So I went off and I did that and I learned a lot more about writing fiction and did a lot of courses and a lot of practice and whatever. I mean, my first book I wrote, when I was 12, I wrote a terrible, terrible, terrible novel when I was 12 <laughs> on an old typewriter on, on this. My dad brought home from work some um, bright orange paper. They were getting rid of it at work. Some reason they didn't want bright orange paper in the office, I don't know. So I typed it out and just, and I even sent it off to publishers and I got some very nice letters back saying, thank you for sending your manuscript, but um, we're not publishing that sort of thing at the moment. Uh, yeah, so I did a load of stuff, practiced, threw it away, and then subsequently... Uh, uh, I've got um, one series out, the Perceivers series, which is about teenagers' mind powers. And then I've got a, another series out, which is kind of a space adventure, spaceships, female heroine kind of thing, bit of romance in there. And I've got a couple of books out under a, a pseudonym as well, which is more romantic-y, fiction-y, mm -hmm. amusing-y yeah. type stuff. So anyway, I'd, I've done all those. And... Um, a friend of mine who's one of your writers, James Swallow, oh, yes. said, oh, you should get in, you should get in to do this. And uh, so he, he sent me, you know, uh, the details or I wrote them down or something anyway. So I, I got yeah. on your list and then I was looking at things that I might be able to do. And I, I pitched for the Terraforming Mars book and I got it. So there you go. 
wonderful and uh, yeah <laughs> I remember when I delivered the manuscript I got a reply from the editor like you absolute star because I hit my deadline she'd never worked with me before you'd never worked with me before and no. it's like you know I think two weeks before or something it was due she just said oh just thought I'd let you know here's the cover I wonder what you think about it it's kind of a little like I wonder if she's okay because <laughs> you get the commission and then you're writing away crazy and then of course you don't need to contact the editor because you're busy you know so anyway it, it's, it's all fine it's all come out people like it it's great yes, yeah yeah there's been some really great reviews for it as well like on net galley it's one of my favorite things is that i get to read all the reviews first and send off the review copies it's like yeah. oh people really like this yeah yeah which is it, it's, it's really nice yeah, yeah. But generally i don't read reviews because you get nine yeah. fantastic reviews and then one person says one little thing that really upsets you and for some reason that is more important than yep. anything else so i yeah, yeah. so you'll yeah, feel free for them so you don't have to and then i, I sort of <laughs> sit there and i shout at the computer like no you silly reviewer you don't know anything <laughs> yeah or, or they re or they review the fact that um the parcel arrived in the post but uh, it's been knocked about and the corner was bent and they've given yeah. it a really bad review it's like but i did <laughs> but the book you know anyway <laughs> so I'm, I'm really pleased that people are in, enjoying it because you know it was, a, it was a new challenge and there was a lot of science in which i had to look up a yes. lot spent a lot of time on google and wikipedia <laughs> and and stuff um, like that so yeah so tell us a bit more about the two main characters then so there's luca and there's julie um yes they, so what i wanted to do what i wanted to do really is have somebody who was new to mars so they come from earth to mars so they're seeing mars uh, they're in the same position as a reader, really. So they're seeing Mars for the first time and learning how it works. And that's Luca. And he has a tragedy in his past. His family were killed in an industrial accident. Um, and he wants to leave all that behind. New start, arrives on Mars. He's indentured labour, so he works for the Thorgate Corporation. Um, and he's there to build a new city. This great new city is going to be called Noctis City, um, which is uh, a little place on the game board. Um, uh, uh, but the minute he turns up, uh, an asteroid crash lands and that fragment, which I was talking about earlier, crashes. He, he sees the crash, yeah. this fragment crashes where it's not supposed to. And that kind of uh, that starts his fate. And he's yeah. German. So I wanted yeah. to because it's a very international cast. The idea is a lot of countries are are on the planet. So I wanted at least one American and one European, and I went for German because I've got some German friends, and I thought if I wanted any German language in the book, I could ask them for translation. Yes. And in the end, there's no German in the book at all. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then uh, Julie, um, she is the head of, was well, kind of like a corporation, the United Nations Mars Initiative, which is an organization which um, had already been on Mars and starting to do some terraforming as part of the United Nations a workforce to try and get Mars terraformed, but they, they weren't going very fast, which is why um, the government set up the, the terraforming project. But she was in charge, and now suddenly there's a terraforming project. She's not in charge anymore. All the corporations are coming, and she's kind of a bit sidelined. So that's her background. She's American, and she is kind of, she's volunteered by the person <laughs> who's effectively the head of state in Mars to, to, to start the investigation. So she starts digging into why this asteroid splintered when it shouldn't have done and why it landed where it did. Bit of a coincidence. And as she manages to unpick everything, she starts to see maybe it wasn't an accident. Maybe there's some corporation skullduggery going on. Um, and those are the two characters. And and we see Luca, then we see Julie, and eventually their stories start to merge. And well, I'm yeah. getting too far ahead, aren't I? Yeah. But that's that's what happens. Yeah. Yay. Um, so why did why did Terraforming Mars sort of interest you when you went to pitch for it? Out of all the sort of IPs that we hold, why was that the one that you sort of went for? Well, first of all, I'm a science fiction fan. Um I have a I'm a lay person's interested in science. I mean, you know, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, I'm not a scientist, but it always intrigued me. Um, and some of the things that you, you hold are, they're vast. You know, if I wanted to really get up to speed on some of these, you know, oh, just read these 50 books, watch these <laughs> 10 movies or whatever, you know, it, whereas this one, it was contained. Um, I also, uh, I've got a lot of game of friends and, you know, before lockdown, they were saying, you must play this Terraforming Mars. It's fantastic. Yeah. 
yeah one of my best friends has got everything you know yeah the the expansions the board the oh, what have you so i know that yeah, everybody and not only do they love the game they keep playing it and what do you do what game are you playing this weekend you know i'm playing yeah. terraforming mars but what about the other 200 games you have on your shelves <laughs> no they're playing this one so uh <laughs> it's really popular and and i think people like it as well because you can you can play it in different ways so you can just start building your own empire you can say oh i'm going to build a forest and an ocean and you can do that off on your own whereas other people can go no i'm gonna really bash the other corporations <laughs> and i'm gonna win um and, stuff. And, pe and people like the science as well just yeah. just to yeah so it was actually good to go into the some of the the depths of, of how these things work and find out a little bit more than the bare description that was on the card which uh was a blessing and a curse because then i had to do a lot of uh, research and uh yeah that yeah. that takes time you know but um yeah so basically it was contained it was a really popular game everybody loved it so um it was Mars, it was the sort of thing that I like. So, great. Yay. So there's a lot of like interesting and humorous descriptions of sort of Terran life on Mars. So how, how did you go about sort of using that research to put it into, okay, well, if you, humanity was there, how do you squish those two things together and make it both fun, interesting, but quite science-based? Like, um, I think it, just every time I wanted to know something, I looked it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, there's a thing that you can do with research. Some people love research, you know, that they spend like months and they, oh, I'm going to do something at Edinburgh Castle. So they go up to the castle. They have a, It's a bit of a holiday for them. And then they go, oh, no, then I've got to write it and find the writing really <laughs> a chore. I'm kind of the other way. I find the research a bit of a chore, but I like the writing. Um, and you can spend a long time researching stuff that you never, ever use. So I read around the subject a little bit and then I just started to go um, into the nitty gritty um, yeah. Uh, and obviously there's things that, you know, they can't breathe on the surface, so they're going to need a, some sort of space suit. Um, there's radiation, so they need protection from that. Um, and that produces some of the drama as well that's in the book. So, uh, you know, clearly if you're on a planet where you can't breathe, there's going to be a dramatic moment where <laughs> you're going to be <laughs> confronted with that problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, and various things like I had a scene on top of Olympus Mons, which is the highest... Uh, mountain in the solar system and I had to I thought that'd be a great scene to have up there so I researched and trying to figure out what it was like and yeah. by the way it's a, it's a simulation it's not actually because uh, they're not really in a position to go up very very tall mountains uh, no. in this part of terraforming Mars but I just wanted to try and show a little bit more of the landscape and things yeah. that people have heard of they've heard of Olympus Mons and and yeah. so forth yeah does that answer the question? Probably not. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned that researching is sort of the thing that you like least. How long do you spend doing research? Um, is it just like... As, as short as possible. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I sat down. The first, first thing I did is I sat down and I watched a load of TV shows set on Mars. I watched The Martian again. Uh, it's a fantastic movie of no help whatsoever in writing the book, but it was a good excuse to pretend I was working just to kind of get the feel. Yeah. But the problem is with a lot of these things, um, you know, films and TV shows, they're filmed on Earth. Yeah. You never see like a third gravity, how that would be. And I kind of struggle with trying to imagining that. It's a bit yeah. of a leap of imagination when you go on Mars because we know what Earth's like and we've seen the video of, of uh, men walking on the moon. That's one sixth gravity there. Mars is one third gravity, so it's kind yeah. of like kind of like the moon, but not like the moon. Um, yeah. And the the planet is smaller as well. So if you're standing in one part of the planet and you kind of look over to the horizon, the curve will be greater. Uh, um, yeah. So anyway, so in it's some ways, watching watching too much well, watching too many TV shows about Mars is kind of not helpful because it can throw yeah. you off a little bit. Um, yeah, and then I just read around stuff like uh oh and until i got to the point where i didn't think it was helping and then i then i just cracked on with the story and then when i needed to know something i looked it up yeah. and then i i didn't get everything right i have to hold my hand up to that one but the people of frick's games who read the book before it came out they have spent years working on this game and they know the terraform Mars scenario um in uh, intimately so if there's anything that i kind of messed up on they picked it up and i was able to change it so that was really helpful 
Yeah. It's well, yeah. slightly annoying. <laughs> <laughs> what? I have to change it? You're kidding. You're kidding. So there's, for, ex- for example, um, there's some canyons that I describe on Mars. I'm thinking these canyons are really big. Think of like the Grand Canyon in yeah. America. That's just huge. No, the Grand Canyon is kind of like a little bit of a, <laughs> a divot in the Earth's crust because these canyons are like kilometers deep and they go on for, uh, yeah, and it's really, even now, trying yeah. to visualize yeah. how that is. Grand Canyon, but grander. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. much grander. Just trying yeah. to visualize that, you know, from someone being on Earth is it's tough. Anyway, I hope I gave it a, a good go. So, yeah. Okay, so um, were there any interesting problems uh, that would affect life on Mars that your characters had to sort of overcome? Um, They think that you really, really enjoyed sort of writing this sort of weird thing that happens on Mars that they wouldn't expect on Earth. Oh, well, my favourite scene is actually going back some years. I wrote a short story set on Mars and I had a, a character uh, who goes out onto the surface of Mars and gets low on oxygen and starts hallucinating his dead wife. And that was actually the inspiration for the the Luca character. And I so wanted to put that scene in there. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So there's this scene where he hallucinates his dead family because he's deprived of oxygen and his brain's going a little crazy. And uh, that's just, this is my favourite scene. That's so, that lovely, but also, oh. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> oh. uh, other things that I have to overcome um, well walking up and down canyons was a bit tough um, I don't know really I think uh, not, not as such yeah. I mean they are they are enclosed in cities and that was something that I, I introduced kind of a garden area because people who live in an enclosed space i mean uh, a lot of the world recently has been in lockdown because of coronavirus and people have been trapped in their houses and i think perhaps, perhaps people understand that that never going outside if you yes. imagine you're on mars and it can take um how many six six months to 18 yes. months to get to mars from earth you're in an enclosed city you can't go outside can you imagine being stuck yeah. there for 20, 30 years, potentially the rest of your life. So I put a little garden area, yeah. which they would have built into one of the cities that people go and walk in and and kind of connect to nature, because I think human beings really need to do that. Yeah. So that's that's one of the scenes that I put in and thought oh. about. What would it like to be on Mars and yeah, just the same four walls all the time? Like a normal day, yeah. That's yeah. Rather than just, yeah, corporate life, like what do people do after they have to finish work and they don't just sit in their little pods and think, I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and that, that's that, that's the problem. I mean, you think if you emigrate to another country uh, on Earth, at least, you know, even going to the other side of the world, it's a 10 hour, 12 yeah. hour flight to get back again. But, you know, six, 18 months. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I yeah. moved to Nottingham from. <laughs> So I moved from Surrey to Nottingham. But yeah, I, I moved in just before the the lockdown. So I moved here, started a new job, didn't know anyone. <laughs> My house was like, oh no, I can't leave. Like, oh great, I made, I made a terrible error. And that was like, yeah, that was that wasn't really that far at all. <laughs> it was still no. like, <laughs> you know, if you want to go back to Surrey, it's still there. You know, it's a trip down the motorway. Yeah. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine here now. I've settled into the whole, oh, this is my house. This is my workplace. This is where I am. <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's it a big like... shock. It's a big shock moving, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I do, I, I actually that. have, uh, funny enough, I actually have a, a character um, in the book who desperate to go home. But oh, the yeah. problem is, well, I'm giving away yeah. the plot. But anyway, the, so, you know, I just... I wanted to say that Mars is a great place and we can go and we can do all these amazing things, but I also wanted the human angle as well because it's not for everybody, you know? Yeah. Certainly not for me. <laughs> I I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think I would go to, to Mars. I used to think, you know, when, yeah, when I was like 10, I used to watch all these space things. Oh, it'd be amazing to go and have all these adventures. And now I'm thinking, oh, you know, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't go to the beach. I couldn't yeah. <laughs> go for a walk in the woods. 
um you know there some sort of transport that would just get me there i can spend a couple of days oh. there go home that would be fine well they haven't invented the teleporter yet but when they do i'm there yeah yeah that's when i will do that definitely so the format of the game for terraform mars sort of moves through the generations as you sort of said um how is this aspect of gameplay going to affect planning both this novel and any like possible future ones well immediately I realised that you couldn't do like a series of novels where you have Luca or Julie and you, you know, over three books, you you follow their life and they have a story arc that goes through because when you play the game, you're playing a generation and in the next round you play another generation. So it's like 30 years on and the people around have died, retired, what have you. So um, it's a self-contained story, uh, story for Luca and Julie in that book, subsequent books will be self-contained um, for other characters, uh, but the arc is Mars moves on. You know, yeah. there's more oxygen, there's more atmosphere, it's warmer. So the things you can do on Mars are different from the first book, from any subsequent yeah. books. And do things that happen sort of in this book sort of affect, sort of, do you imagine it affecting like, I mean, yeah, without giving away like spoilers of, oh, this thing happens, but do you, are you envisioning that things that happen in one are going to then affect sort of that? There'll be of there'll be there'll be kind of references, but not affect um, as such. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What was your, <laughs> uh, so we've already said like your favorite scene to write. Um, was oh, I've told the, you that the hallucination yeah, yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I also loved um, I, I love the banter as well when I can get some. A bit of banter. So Julie has got like a second in command. He's called Kareem. He's my English character because you know English people got to be there, um, and uh, they have a kind of an easy go relationship, and they have a bit of banter between them. That kind of lightens it up, and yeah. that's more fun. And then uh, Luca works with a group of people, and I have some scenes with him and the other people, and they're kind of sharing, hopefully, witty banter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I like to do that. They. Um, they have a game of football in the canteen, and uh, that's a kind of a nice, I like a bit of a character thing. But that caused yeah. me a real problem because uh, obviously a lot of our readers are going to be in America. You say football to American, they think American football. All these characters are European. They call it football. They don't call it yeah. soccer. So uh, immediately I decided to do that. I went, oh no! And I looked <laughs> up. I actually typed typed soccer into Google Translate into like. Uh, French and German and all these European languages, and it just comes back as football, you know, football. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's when I had to have my American character. Every time we talked about football, he'd have to remind them that they were talking about soccer. So <laughs> I had that kind of, you know, yeah. kind of banter going on. So that was one of the problems that actually turned out to be uh, a bit of a fun solution. So yeah. those are the sort of things I tend to like. And then sometimes I get a bit carried away and I have to cut the scene. And <laughs> oh. But yeah. You know, they're fun yeah. and the hallucination scene I like because I just think it gets to the heart of the character because yeah. he arrives on Mars, his, his family have died, he's tried to forget them, but obviously he's never going to forget them and move on in his life completely. And at the moment where he thinks he might die, you know, there they are, but encouraging him to live in, yeah. the, in the way ghosts would, I suppose. Do you have a favourite character that was like the best fun to write? Oh, well, I guess... Uh, Kareem, which I mentioned, which is Julie's second in command, because he's kind of like a, a light, lively kind of character. Um, though you do have to be, be a little bit careful because um, when you're writing a book, if you introduce like the quirky side character, they end up being more fun <laughs> than the main characters. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I made sure he didn't overshadow everybody else, but the parent and she she gives as good as she gets as well so uh he's quite fun but I, I i didn't try to overdo him because he's not the main character so yeah right and uh so um with your sort of what's your work schedule like when you're writing because you say you also obviously work so how do you fit writing into so um, I, I write in the morning, but I'm quite lucky because I'm on the late shift. So I read the news in the afternoon. So I go in and I start at 11.30 and then I work through without a break. So I get up in the morning and I, I write in the morning and then I write at weekends. Um, and uh, I first I get up, I sit on the sofa, I have a cup of tea and kind of ease myself into the day. I've yeah. tried to get up and get straight on the computer and sometimes I just 
I can't. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes I get in a major panic and I take some days off work and you know, my holiday, <laughs> my holiday <laughs> is writing from like six in the morning to about, um, yeah. And I, I have a friend who, who reads my stuff as well. And she's, I usually ring up and I complain to her when I'm stuck or what have you. Yeah. And, uh, for this last book, I remember I did a, oh yeah. As usual, what happens is you start off and then you're kind of going slow and you think, all right, so many words per day. Yeah, and that'll and I'll get to the deadline. That'll be fine. No, it doesn't happen like that. You always fall behind, and then it's a mad rush towards the end. Yeah, but that's kind of natural as well because you you learn more about the world and the characters as you go. So therefore, it takes more time at the beginning and it's quicker at the end. But there's always some sort of mad rush. And uh, I remember ringing her up. She, I she said, "Well, ring me when you finish." So I rang her at half past eleven at night to say, "I finished." And woke up her husband. But apart from that, um, <laughs> so yeah, I write get up about seven, have a cup of tea, you know, and then get try and get into the chair by about eight. If I don't make it by eight, then I I start to fall behind, and yeah. then um, do stuff at weekends, and uh, usually take some time off and and, and work right through in, in holiday time. Uh, but this time writing the Mars book, I was absolutely determined not to let my garden to go to pot. Because the previous <laughs> book I'd written on a deadline, uh, you know, I'll have to do this book, have to do this book. And like the weeds were coming up. And, uh, so, uh, yeah. I, However, break then. <laughs> I, I know it's just like there's too many things in the day. But even people who don't have a day job, there's too many things in their day yeah. as well to, to, to fit it all in. So um, the morning has to be sacrosanct to do the writing um otherwise yeah it just doesn't get it done and at the end of the day you know you can say to yourself well i'll come home and i'll spend an hour doing some work it's just i have brains dead by then i'm sorry yeah. seven o'clock at night mm -mm, no yeah dinner cup of tea bit of telly bed <laughs> sleep yeah <laughs> i'm exactly yeah. the same it's like half night it's like oh it must be bedtime now <laughs> just go for a nap yep i am the same um so uh, that sort of brings us nicely to sort of the, the end of the chat. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to plug, tell people about? Um, oh, well, um, if you want to read some of my other books. Yes. Um, there, if you go to my website, janekillick.com, on the front page, there's a kind of a thing. You can you can sign up and get the, the first of the Perceivers trilogy and the first of the a Freelance trilogy. That's the Teenagers of Special Powers and the Space Adventure one for free just by signing up to my newsletter. So uh, read those books for free. And then if you like them, you can keep reading the rest. So there. Yeah, that's very exciting. Oh. That's and about it, really. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> and then and Terraforming Mars, really uh, the, the first book uh, in the Shadow of Demos is coming out in paperback September 21 for America and the UK end of October 21. Yes. Um, but if you're watching this kind of like on the repeat on YouTube or whatever, I guess it could be out already. And the ebook is available now. Yes. Uh, it's no. available globally. Yes. No. Yeah. I got a text from my friend who pre ordered it and it said, Jane Book Good. Very good. <laughs> that Brilliant is a brilliant review from my friend. <laughs> yeah. I, I assumed if they didn't like it, they wouldn't have said anything. So. <laughs> Oh, we've had a couple of questions come in just at the end. Oh. sneaked in. So okay. John says, how many novels are planned in this series? Am I allowed to say? <laughs> so I think it's been implied. Yeah. Okay, so um, there are three planned. Well, supposedly we're looking to do three, and then after that, who knows? Yeah. So I'm, um, I've sent in some ideas for the second one at the moment, and the third one I have no idea. <laughs> but... Uh, that's the plan. And then after that, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But that's the plan for three. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be good. Oh, and Nick uh, Drakas just says, great chat. Thank you, ladies. Yay. Oh, Thanks for you're welcome. watching. Uh, that's very nice of you uh, to be here so early. Um, so there's the book again in the Shadow of Demas. It's out now in ebook and it's out on the 21st of September in the US and Canada. And for the rest of the world, it will be with you towards 28th of October. Um, Yes, our UK dates are just a little bit behind at the moment as things keep getting stuck on the water, uh, which is, yeah, it's been super fun 
super fun thing that's been happening <laughs> stressing everyone out but <laughs> by the end well the you year, know my, my stressful thing was i wrote the book i sent it in people were happy that was fine yeah. you know the rest of it i'm just like you can handle that stress yeah. I to... <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah that's my stress though i take that one <laughs> yes yes but yes jay thank you so much for coming oh along. you're welcome uh, it was really nice to chat to you for the first time. Yeah. And did you like uh, my did you like my background, by the way? Yeah, so I've been going like, oh, well done. Yes. <laughs> Just don't sneeze because it's going to fall over. Um. <laughs> yeah, I I often think I'm going to do like a green screen with things, but because my hair has got green in it, it then makes my hair disappear. <laughs> so well, that would be you know what? Well, how would you look bald? That would be <laughs> another another one. <laughs> Not great, I imagine. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for for tuning in and watching the the repeat and everything. And um, yeah. perhaps we'll do it again sometime. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I love having these little chats. So yeah, we'll we'll organise something, uh, maybe some sort of panel type thing with some other. And authors, in person think. would be lovely. Can we go um, out and meet people? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to meet people again. Yes. Yeah, I could go to Nottingham and see the delights. Yes, you can come see our, our we we work in the basement of an old brewery. So yeah, you can come see our offices as well because we're in three times a week in the office, Monday to Wednesdays. You can come yeah. visit. Yes. And good. Very nice pubs around the around the corner from us as well. Oh, now pub. Now you see that's good. Yes. So yeah. um <laughs> stick it in the diary as we speak. Yes. yes. Perfect. Well, uh thank you everyone for coming along and uh we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>